Hey everybody! In this video we are going to write down uh, Fermat's Theorem, also uh, known as the Interior Extremum Theorem, as well as Darboe's Theorem. So we'll uh, maybe we'll prove one of them and then uh, we'll do an example of the other. So uh, let's see here, how about we start with Fermat's Theorem. So Fermat's Theorem, or as I said the interior extremum theorem, which actually I'd never heard that language before I read Abbott's book, uh, but it yeah, makes some sense. Uh, so here's the idea. We have a function f on an open interval a, b, and we're going to assume that f is differentiable. All right, so uh, if I uh, find some point between a and b which is at least as big right who or rather whose image is at least as big as all the other images of f then the derivative at that point must be zero okay so if c is some point between a and b such that the image of c is at least as big as every other image right for all x in the interval, then the derivative at c has to be 0. All right, so you're basically saying, oh, look, if the value of the function is bigger than everything around it, then I better have a horizontal tangent at that point, right? So this would be our c. Okay, this is essentially saying, oh, yeah, if you have a local maximum of a differentiable function, then you have to be zero. Uh, the, the derivative has to be zero at that max point. All right, so let's do a proof of that. So what I want to do is uh, define a couple of sequences that are going to converge to C. So we'll define x dot to be the sequence given by c minus 1 over n. So this is be how we converge to c from the left-hand side. And uh, at least if n is large enough, then we know that c minus 1 over n will be inside the interval a, b, because c is an interior point. So we may not be able to necessarily start n at 1, but we can start it somewhere. All right, And then y dot is going to be the same thing, but from the right-hand side. Okay. And so we know that uh, x dot and y dot both converge to C. And we also know that, of course, f is differentiable at C because C is inside the interval a, b. Right? So we know f is differentiable at C. And so what that tells us uh, is that the difference quotients, the, uh, the difference quotient of f, right, at based at C, applied to each of these sequences has to converge to the derivative of F at C. So this implies if I take the difference quotient of F at C and I apply it to the sequence X dot, or I take, again, the C difference quotient of F and I apply it to the sequence Y dot, both of them have to converge to F prime of C because these sequences converge to C, right? That comes from our sequential characterization of, uh, of the derivative. Okay. Um, also, let's see. We know that uh, at least uh, uh, for n at least 1, or maybe past a certain point, um, we know that xn, well, this is true for all n at least 1, we know that xn minus c, Okay, so remember, this is our xn. If I get rid of c, then uh, this is going to be less than 0, right? Because this is going to equal, let's see, uh, c minus 1 over n minus c is minus 1 over n. So this is less than 0. And if I apply f to each of these individually, so if I have f of xn minus f of c, well, this is... Let's see, xn is something that's not equal to c. And f of c, remember, we have this property, right? 
f of c is at least as big as everything else. So if I subtract f of c from f of something else, then this is going to be less than or equal to zero, right? f of c is the bigger thing. Okay, so what does that tell me about my difference quotient, right? Well, because my difference quotient, when I apply it to x dot, I'll get in the numerator f of xn minus f of c, and in the denominator I'll get xn minus c. And so my difference quotient applied to x dot, well, this is a uh, non-negative number divided by a negative number. So this is going to be, I'm sorry, a negative number divided by a non-positive number <laughs> in some order. There we go. Non-positive, <laughs> negative. In any case, when I take the divising, right, when I divide, the negatives, if they're, you know, whatever negative I have are going to go away. And so... Uh, the difference quotient is going to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, now what if we do the y's? Well, if I take yn minus c, this is going to equal 1 over n, which is positive. And then uh, if I apply f to yn and subtract f of c, then, well, again, this is going to be less than or equal to zero because f of c is this max. So this will be less than or equal to zero. And so if I look at the difference quotient, I'm going to be dividing this non-positive number by this positive number. And so that's going to imply that the difference quotient of f applied to y dot will be less than or equal to zero. Ah, so I know that the difference quotient on x dot is greater than or equal to zero. I know that the difference quotient on y dot is less than or equal to zero. But the difference quotients both have to, for, for any, uh, any sequence converging to c, right, they both have to converge to the same thing. And there's only one, right, in f prime of c specifically. So this tells you that f prime of c, right, is going to have to be both less than or equal to zero and greater than or equal to zero, right? No, not, not exactly. This says, right, my difference quotient is always positive or zero, and or it's always negative or zero, right? The only way those can converge to the same thing is if the thing they're converging to is zero itself. So that tells us that f prime of c, which is what these difference quotients converge to, must be zero. Okay, and so that, that proves the result. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on to Darbo's theorem. So uh, the, the reason, you know, of course, this is interesting, right? You saw this in Calc 1, right, from Oz's theorem all over the place. You're trying to uh, maximize a function, and so you take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and you say, oh, okay, you know, I'm doing that because if I'm going to find some max point, I know that the derivative is zero. Of course, there's another thing, right? You could have something like this, right? Or if we flip it over to get a max, right? This is where the derivative doesn't exist. That's a that's a separate issue. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's do Darbo's theorem because this is something you probably didn't do in your Calc one course. All right. So Darbo's theorem, which we won't prove here, uh, is that if f is differentiable. And it's going to be differentiable on a closed interval, a, b. All right, so probably the function is defined you know, on a much wider scope, but we're just looking at the specific subinterval, a, b. So if you know f is differentiable on the closed interval, a, b, then the derivative of f satisfies the intermediate value property. on a b okay so this is meaning that if you um, look at f of a and f of b and you know let's say for example you have f of a you have f of b this gives you some nice closed interval and, and let's just assume for sake of argument that f of a is uh, less than f of b then every element in this interval has an f preimage. Okay, in AB. 
Okay. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm not going to prove this here. I really want to talk about, though, the big consequence of this. All right. So although this is quite interesting that differentiability implies that the derivative well, this doesn't say that the derivative is necessarily continuous. It just says that it satisfies the intermediate value property. But if we think of this in the contrapositive form, then what we see is if, a, if you say you have some function, if g does not satisfy the intermediate value property, okay? then, well, if it was satisfying it, then maybe it was the derivative of something, right? But if it doesn't satisfy the intermediate value property, then it can't be the derivative of something. Because Darbo's theorem says the derivative of something does satisfy the intermediate value property. So if G does not satisfy the IVP, then G is not the derivative of something. All right, or if we want to use more precise language, i.e., G does not have an antiderivative. Okay, so remember, F prime here is the derivative of F, which means that F is an antiderivative for F prime. So if you don't satisfy the IVP, you can't have an antiderivative. So let's do an example of that. Okay, we'll go back to my favorite function, piecewise function here, right? So h of x is going to be the function which is 3 or 1. 3 when x is less than or equal to 7, and 1 when x is greater than 7. Okay, so we graph this thing. Okay, there's 7, 1, 3, two, 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 boink jumps down to one, boom. Okay, so there is our h of x. Okay, and the claim is that this function h has no antiderivative. It is impossible to find a function on any, like just take any interval, right? So say we take, a, I don't know, the interval, uh, you know, three to 10. Okay, so we'll cut it off there. Okay, this has no antiderivative on 3 to 10. And the reason why is because H does not satisfy the IVP. And so it cannot have, this is just incredible, right? This very simple function cannot have an antiderivative. And although we haven't gotten into integration proper yet, if you think ahead, you think, oh, you know, I know you can use like the fundamental theorem of calculus or something, right, to integrate. All right. One of the big things we're going to talk about is that anti-differentiation and integration are not, they are not the same thing. Okay. And that may come as a shock to a lot of people. Okay. But they are not the same thing. There are going to be instances where you can use one to get an answer that is the same as the other. But that doesn't mean they're the same thing. Okay. Uh, next time we will go through uh, a lot of the mean value theorems and their associated uh, <laughs> other theorems. Yep. Yeah. Rawls theorem, generalized mean value theorem. Okay. We will see you there.